Hello, uh, my name is uh, Pastor Irving Rivera, and um, you are about to hear a message uh, that I have preached uh, about um, the spirit world, about demonic forces, and um, how we are engaged in a spiritual warfare. Um, just from brief clarification, uh, just so that I may have missed this in the sermon, I am not saying that uh, every sickness or disease or afflictions that people suffer uh, uh, you know, are not caused by uh, perhaps some chemical imbalance and some people need medication to help them uh, through that. I just want to make that clear that I'm aware of that. Not every sickness or disease is a demon or anything of that nature. What I want to impress on you is that there is a spiritual warfare going on and that um, we have an enemy that doesn't like us very much. So I just just wanted to make that clear. I hope that these messages that you hear through YouTube from the Meadow Hill Church are blessing you. Um, and if you would like to come and visit us, we're at 211 uh, Fletcher Drive in the town of Newburgh, and our services every Sunday are at 10:30 a.m. God bless you. May you enjoy the message. Using titles uh, to message, and sometimes I. I like to uh, use titles of movies or books or, or even articles that I'd read as a title uh, if it is a catching uh, title and it'll help people to remember what was said and in the message. But when it came to this particular title, The War Against Evil, um, I couldn't do anything uh, uh, with that because I wanted to us to understand um, or at least uh, stay with that particular uh, uh, fact that there is a war against evil. And, um, and it's something that for some reason or another we have uh, missed. Now I use Psalms 103, um, some of the verses there, although the entire Psalms uh, 103 speaks to us so beautifully. It was my mother's favorite psalms. Every time we went to a home to pray for a sick family, a sick person in that family, she would read that psalm, Psalms 103, a very powerful psalms, one that has stayed with me uh, pretty much all of my life. Um, and um, I can't not say that it's one of my favorite psalms because I only have 150 uh, that, that are my favorite. Uh, and so, uh, yeah, I, that covers it, you know, right there. Pretty much all the psalms for me are powerful. And as we went through a whole entire summer uh, looking at the psalms, what a blessing uh, indeed that was. Um, but in that psalms, pretty much, uh, the psalmist makes it clear that the God that we serve is a God that is moved by our infirmities. And Paul the Apostle affirms that also, that God is aware of sickness, that God is aware of diseases, that God is aware of the troubles and the hardship that we go through in this life. He's very much aware of it. And even Jesus himself said that in this life, in this life, you will suffer much tribulation. Uh, in other words, uh, you know, God was not in denial uh, of, of the fact that in this world, which is a fallen world, a broken world, a sinful world, a world that has turned his back completely on God from the very beginning of time. We can't look back and just blame Adam for it because we just follow suit in the same way. And as I was preaching uh, last Sunday um, in Jeremiah 2.13, where um, all of heaven was confused why the people of Israel will turn their backs on the fountain of life, which is God, um, and, and, and go after cisterns that have holes in them that cannot hold water. Uh, and, 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 and all of heaven was baffled and, and, and uh, astonished astonished at how people could abandon God and the things of God to go after uh, the pleasures of the world and instead of God, you know. <clears throat> 
And we talked about that. But here, um, the uh, psalmist is reminding the children of Israel that the God that we serve is a God that is aware. He is aware of everything that's happening in our lives. Every detail of our lives he is concerned with. You know, we can go on and look at many verses, uh, even in the Old Testament, uh, where uh, uh, the prophets tell us that God has written each and every one of our names in the palm of his hand. I don't even know why he would do that, but he did, you know, and only God can do something like that. And, you know, perhaps he just sits there and admires uh, 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 you because he is in love with you and he cares about you. As a matter of fact, the Bible says that we are his crown creation. We're the apple of his eye. And basically what I'm trying to uh, uh, impress them on you, and Jesus tried to impress that on us too when he said that every hair on our head is counted, that the Lord has done that. You know? And basically, and then he also says that, that a sparrow doesn't fall off the tree, that God is not aware of it. And uh, he, we can go on and on and, 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 say, and share with you how much God is concerned about you, how much God knows about you, how much God cares for you, and how much God knows what you're going through very well. But there is something more that he wants us to understand. And it is something that I am sensing and feeling and I have felt for some time as I look at God's scripture and, and look at these themes that um, we have lost sight of this, that the church has lost sight that, yes, there is an evil in the world. Yes, there are demons, there are spirits that we are fighting against, that are coming against us every single day. And sometimes, for some reason, we have lost sight of that. And so... Uh, um, this is where this message is, is, is coming from. And, and the reason I, I titled it The War Against Evil. There is a, a, a philosophy uh, that is known as dualism, and um, it has different aspects to it. You know, there's a spiritual dualism, there's a religious dualism, there's a political dualism, they have all these uh, a dualism, but... Um, but this particular one I'm speaking to you about holds that there are two essential evil or equal forces, two essential equal forces, good and evil, like in the superhero movies or as in Star Wars, where you have the good side and then you have the dark side of the force. Um, and But here's what I'm telling you. Um, that philosophy doesn't hold any weight when it comes to the gospel of Jesus Christ, when it comes to the Lord Jesus Christ himself, because um, there is no dualism there. There is no equal power going on here. Uh, you know, Satan is powerful, and we know that. The demons are powerful. They're more powerful than we are, but they're not more powerful powerful than Jesus. He is more powerful. He is the almighty. He is greater. He's more powerful. As a matter of fact, he can take care of them at the snap of a finger. They will be gone in history. The Bible even tells us that he could have called 20,000 angels to rescue him if he wanted to. He could take care of these things one, two, three, but, um, that's not the case, and that's not what's happening. And so, but the fact is that Jesus has already won the victory over the enemy. There's no, uh, 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 you know, big fight waiting to come and happen to see who wins. He won. He won already. He won at Calvary. He won even at death when he said it is finished. It is done. It is taken care of. That's it. Satan was put in deep check way back 2,000 years ago. But for some reason, we haven't got the message yet. For some reason, it hasn't arrived to us yet. For some reason, we haven't got the emancipation of proclamation in our hands to know that we have the victory through Jesus Christ. And what we have is people just 
you know, uh, uh, um, thinking uh, uh, that that demons and all these things are just like Santa Claus or the or the fairy tooth or uh, uh, or the Easter Bunny, but these things are real. Two thirds of Jesus' ministry on earth was casting out demons. You know, when I heard that phrase the first time, I said, I got to find this out for myself. And you cannot help but read the book of Mark and just this one chapter alone, the first chapter of Mark, you have mention of demons almost seven times. And then you can go throughout the entire book, Matthews, Luke, and John, and even in the uh, letters that are written um, and find out about the fact that there are demons and that they are real. And so if two thirds of Jesus' ministry was in dealing with demonic forces and all that, that is something we're gonna have to say, why? Why is that? Why is it that Jesus comes down to this earth and and the first thing he does, he deals with demonic forces. He deals with these uh, 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 demons. And, um, and why is that important for the gospel writers to make this clear right in the outset of Jesus' ministry? And so, when you examine the scriptures concerning the coming of the Messiah, you find that the people back then, now here is, I, I want you to uh, understand what I'm going to present to you right now. What, why is this so important? And why am I preaching this at this time? And why am I bringing this to you? And why are we talking about demons or evil spirits? Um, when we already know and I already established through scripture and what I've said to you, that Jesus already conquered them and took care of that. And he's the winner. There's no, uh, someone's going to win at the end. He won already, okay? We need to know that and get that clear in our minds. But there is a problem, and it almost seems like when Jesus came to earth, he said, I need to, t I need to make this thing clear. For some reason, they're not understanding my reason for coming and, my, and, 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 and what really has transpired and has happened. Now, let me just explain uh, 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 to you this. The Jews, they were waiting for a Messiah. But here's what they were waiting for. They were waiting for someone who was going to uh, uh, topple whoever was in power, whether it was the Babylonians, whether it was the Medes or the Persians, or the Grecian Empire, or the Roman Empire, they were waiting for a Messiah that will topple the Romans, that will take them out of power, and that this Messiah will sit on the throne of David forever and ever and conquer the entire world. This is the Messiah that the uh, Jews were waiting for. But here is the thing, as we well know, because we have the gospel and we can look back 2,000 years what happened and what took place. Here comes Jesus, um, born uh, uh, in Bethlehem, just like the prophet said he would be born, uh, born of a virgin, just like the prophet said he would be. Uh, and now he is comes to the world and... Um, as far as the Jews were concerned, he doesn't look too much like a, a Messiah. But those who were hanging with him, at least the disciples, they saw the miracles. They saw him walking on waters. They saw him raising the dead. They saw him uh, feed 5,000. They saw him uh, calm the storms. They saw all the miracles. So as far as they were concerned, they said, yeah, 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 this guy fits the picture. And uh, after he gets finished doing all of these miracles, the next thing he's going to do He's going to topple the Romans. He's going to knock them out, and we are going to be in power. So here are the Jews looking for a political victory, looking for some uh, uh, for Jesus to come and mess up uh, these Romans and knock them out and and be in power. But Jesus did not come to this earth to establish a physical kingdom, but he came to establish a spiritual kingdom in the hearts of men, in the hearts. 
He came to release men from the bondage of sin and evil and the demonic forces and to take his place in the throne of every one of our hearts. So they just wanted him to come and defeat the Romans and establish his kingdom. But he didn't come to bring peace in the Middle East and solve some political conflict. And they needed to understand that the war was much, much larger scale than they thought. They needed to understand that it was a cosmic struggle against principalities, against spiritual forces of evil in high places. He came to bring a decisive victory in the cosmic conflict to drive evil out of people's hearts and bring peace between men and God. So here's what I'm saying, basically. The Jews, they were waiting for a, a simple uh, 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 taking over of, uh, of, of, of Jerusalem, of the world. That was it. But it was a greater power, greater force that Jesus was coming against, and they were missing it. So what happens? Jesus comes into the scene, and all of a sudden, you have demons going crazy all over the place. Everywhere he went, the demons would manifest and say, oh, what are you doing here so early? Yo, why have you showed up? Why are you tormenting us? Thou son of David, thou uh, uh, son of the living God, thou holy one. You know, hey, here's an interesting thing. No human would use that language. Only the demons. And the Bible tells us that he would shut them up. He would tell them to be quiet. And you wonder to yourself, well, why would he do that? They were only declaring that he was the Messiah, that he was the Son of God. Here's the thing. Demons knew who Jesus was. Demons knew that he was the Son of God. They knew who he was. And so when they address Jesus, they address him as such. But when humans come to him, whether they're sick or afflicted or whatever they're going through, they come to him in a, in a humble way and, and, and not declaring him in anything, but seeking his mercy and seeking some healing from him and using a totally different language. Now, some preachers today have a hard time preaching about demons. They don't want to be labeled as superstitious, simplistic, primitive, or unscientific. And many people in our culture, as I said earlier, all they think about demons as is something from, you know, some fairy tale somewhere. It's interesting, I was, as I was thinking about this, in, in 1995, uh, there was a movie called The, Us the Usual Suspects. And, and it contained a memorable line spoken by the character played by Kevin Spacey about the existence or non-existence of the devil. And it went like this. You've heard it. The greatest trick the devil ever pulled was convincing the world he didn't exist. Now, that wasn't something that was uh, 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 originated in the movie and all that. That goes way back hundreds of years. Uh, it's been said, you know, through different ways uh, by different philosophers and different teachers and, and scholars, you know. And so our modern intellects say, oh, people didn't know about mental illness back then. And how can you believe in something you cannot see? They say it's unscientific to believe in something you can't see. What about the human mind? The human brain is a physical thing that you can observe, but the mind isn't. The mind is immaterial. You can't study it with any kind of empirical observation. It's beyond the reach of science. And yet, 
We know it exists because you need it in order to doubt it exists. Are you with me? Stay with me, please. <laughs> and so, if you question whether your mind exists, you have to use your mind to do that questioning. Now, when I, when I was studying this and, and, and writing uh, this down, um, I thought about something and something that's happening in our world. And perhaps this is going to sound controversy to some of you, uh, but this is my spin, okay? And please don't go out there saying that the Bible says, or God said, because I may be good looking and all that, but I don't look like God, okay? Or Jesus or anything like that. Okay, so, you know, um, this is, you know, my speculation, okay, and my looking at things. But I'm a, I get a little bit disturbed, I get a little bit upset, and, um, and it bothers me when the intellectuals, well, quote unquote, intellectuals on television, whenever there is a mass shooting, like the one we had in, in the Walmart in El Paso or the, the recent one and others that we've had. We've had so many. We've only had uh, close to 300 this year. Um, of mass shooting, the first thing that we hear a commentator say uh, that there's something mentally wrong with this person. And right away, they uh, bring the problem to the mentally challenged. You know, and I, I personally feel that's a disservice to mentally challenged people because uh, not all mentally challenged people are out there trying to kill people or hurt people. They're hurting themselves and all that. And to accuse the mentally challenged and to accuse that, that community of being the mass murderers, you know, I have a hard time with that. Now we know when we have studied uh, 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 these uh, per people who have done this, that they have had some mental challenges and some of them, you know, had, had suffered certain things. But to immediately, when something like this happens, the first impression that people give or they, they give to people is that this person had to come from the mentally challenged community. And basically the reason for that is the dismissal of evil in our world. They don't want to admit that. They don't want to admit it. You see, because when science cannot figure out what's going on, when science cannot make any heads of it, the first thing they say, it's a chemical imbalance, it's this, it's that, and they, and they, and they begin to uh, put all kinds of things in because they can't explain it. But if you're a believer of the gospel and you're a believer of God's word and everything else, you know that there's an evil in this world, you, in this world. You know that there are demonic forces out to destroy and destroy people. You know, Jesus said Satan came to, to destroy. But that he has come so that he might give us life. So basically, when Jesus invaded this world, he invaded this world to demonstrate to us that he has conquered the evil, that he has conquered the demons, that he is the victor, and that he is the winner of this whole thing. But we reject that. And we reject him. And we reject the gospel. We reject the word of God when the word of God is very clear. And the reason we do that because we don't want to believe in God. We don't want to believe in the gospel. We don't want to believe in all that. But you know what? What the world does with that, that's their business. But I think it's a real serious problem when the church of Jesus Christ it thinks of these things the same way the world thinks of them and not see it the way the Bible and the Word of God describes it. So, anyway, if I confused you, I'm sorry. But we know that, um, that Jesus, although he came to this world and conquered and won the battle, 
It's good to see Thelma again. Uh, you know, that's my own personal feel. Okay, you know, praise God. But we know that Jesus did not finish off evil at his first coming. The war is still ongoing today, obviously. And we are engaged in that war, the war against evil. We are part of that battle. So how do we go about fighting? What's the strategy? What are the weapons we should be using? Well, Paul the Apostle in 2 Corinthians chapter 10, he says this, and listen carefully. He says, the world is unprincipled. It's dog eat dog out there. The world doesn't fight fair, but we don't live or fight our battles that way. We never have and we never will. The tools of our trade aren't for marketing, for manipulation, but they are for demolishing entire massive corrupt culture, massively corrupt culture. We use our powerful God tools for smashing warped philosophies, tearing down barriers erected against the truth of God, fitting every loose thought and emotion and impulse into the structure of life shaped by Christ. Our tools are ready at hand for clearing the ground of every obstruction and building lives of obedience into maturity. And so the weapons of our warfare, he's saying, are not carnal. We do not battle against humans or, or anything. Our battle is against principalities and rulers of darkness. That's where the war is. The war is there. And God hasn't left us on our own. He's given us an equipment. He's given us tools to fight these battles. And what I don't understand is that Christians don't use them. They ignore them like they weren't written, like it's not there. And as you just heard me say, the greatest trick the devil ever pulled was to convince people he doesn't exist. And, and he is doing a good job, even in Christians and in the church. Now, Jesus made it very clear that the gates of hell will not prevail against the church. And basically, what he was saying is, hey, we're going to be attacked. We're going to uh, 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 be attacked in all kinds of ways. But we're on a winning side. We're on a winning side. The gates of hell is not going to prevail. And that doesn't mean that we're behind the gates and the devil is like the big bad wolf going saying, I huff and I puff and I'm going to blow your Christian house down. You know, that's not what that says. What that says is that we are on the outside saying to the devil, we're going to huff and we're going to puff and we're going to blow your gates down. That's what Jesus said. And the gates of hell will not prevail against the church. The church is suffering now. The church is getting hit left and right all over the world. And um, we can go on and, and, and give you all kinds of statistics and all that, but I'm not going to get into all of that. But I want you to understand and I think God wants us to understand, and, the, and Christ wanted to understand, that we're in a spiritual battle. And you know what? If you're a Christian, welcome to the battle. You're in a, you know, we're not in a playground. We're, we're in a battlefield. Every single one of us are in that battle. And Christ has made provision for us. Not only does he fight for us, but he gave us tools he gave us an equipment, okay? I'm going to finish this sermon now. I want to read a, a, um, a very familiar passage of Scripture to you, okay, so that uh, um, we'll understand this a little better. And the very familiar Scripture is Ephesians chapter 6 and beginning with verse 10. So, um, if you can, Aaron, if you can put that a camera on that Scripture so that people are not looking at the back of my head 
ahead and think I'm talking to myself. Okay, here's what it says. And that about wraps it up. God is strong. And he wants you strong. So take everything the master has set out for you, well-made weapons of the best materials, and put them to use so you will be able to stand up to everything the devil throws your way. This is no afternoon athletic contest that we'll walk away from and forget about in a couple of hours. This is for keeps, a life or death fight to the finish against the devil and all his angels. Be prepared. You're up against far more than you can handle on your own. Take all the help you get, every weapon God has issued, so that when it's all over, but the shouting, you'll still be on your feet. Truth, righteousness, peace, faith, and salvation are more than Words. Learn how to apply them. You'll need them throughout your life. God's word is an indispensable weapon. In the same way, prayer is essential in this ongoing warfare. Pray hard and long. Pray for your brothers and sisters. Keep your eyes open. Keep each other's spirits up so that no one falls behind or drops out. We say in Greek, Ma claro no canto un gallo. A rooster cannot sing any clearer than that. It's there. Don't ignore it. Don't brush it off. Your family is suffering. Your children are suffering. Your friends are suffering. People around you are suffering, are hurting, they're broken. Some are going under, some are ready to give up. You have a weapon of peace to bring to people. You have a weapon of righteousness, of power to bring to people, to bring people out of bondage. Here is what the Word of God is saying to us. Hey, apply these truths to your life. Get filled with Jesus. Use the word of God. I repeat, use the word of God. Get it out of that table you have it set up with that nice, beautiful fake flower. Dust it off and get into it and start reading God's word and start applying God's word. Start believing God's word. That's what's going to defeat the devil in your home and in your life, being in the Word of God. And then he says, and, and, and don't forget the weapon of prayer. You ever wonder why the devil keeps you from praying? <laughs> he knows he's in big trouble once you start praying. And he'll discourage you. He'll do everything he can. He'll put on your best movie on TV that night just to keep you away from the word, to keep you away from prayer, to keep you away from using the weapon, the weapon that can defeat the enemy. Hey, things start breaking out in your home? <laughs> Break out the Christian albums, dust those off too. You know, I have albums, you know. I've heard, you know, nobody even knows what that is. Anyway, CDs, okay. <laughs> Bring out that Christian music. Take out the word of God and open it right in your living room. And come against the bowels of the devil in the name of Jesus. You have the power. He has given you the power. 
over all the power of the enemy, and nothing shall at any means harm you. Let's not forget that we are in a spiritual war. Don't forget that. Don't forget that. Bow your heads with me.